of the dearest moments in my life was when I became a mom. I was handed a tiny, fragile human being, and I felt completely unprepared and very much caught off guard. And as she lay in my arms sleeping, my mind was racing, and I remember thinking to myself, what is this tiny child thinking about? And who will she become? Among other questions like, do I have nearly enough diapers for her? And, and I think many parents share these same thoughts. And soon the initial wonder starts to fade and you're left wondering how every interaction you have with this child, how everything you say or do around them, how that might affect the person that they are today and shape who they might become in the future. But even if you're not a parent, you've definitely had a point in your life where you've thought to yourself, how did I become the person that I am today? You're not alone. Humans have been wondering these questions for hundreds of years, and scientists have formulated these questions. It's the classic nature versus nurture debate. How much of the human mind is determined at birth, and how much do our experiences help shape our personas? But what if I were to tell you that we're now at a point where we can start to investigate some of these questions? We can use non-invasive neuroimaging to take pictures of a baby's brain while they're asleep inside of an MRI scanner, and we can get beautiful images of their brain anatomy, as well as colorful images of their connectivity patterns. So we can use non-invasive neuroimaging to peek inside a baby's brain, compare this baby's brain to other baby's brains, and we can use computational modeling and artificial intelligence to make predictions of future outcome in each child. And we can test these predictions as a child gets older. I'm going to talk about a few studies from work in my lab that help to demonstrate the feasibility and the utility of studying the human mind longitudinally. And first, we'll start by talking about reading. So reading is a skill that's acquired in a specific age range in most countries, usually around the ages of four and five. There's a region of the brain that's dedicated to uh, reading. And this brain region is usually called the visual word form area or the reading area in most people. And this is actually my brain and my reading area. And what's cool about this brain region is that it doesn't exist in individuals who can't read yet. It exists as in the brain tissue, of course, exists, but the cells in this region don't know the difference between written words and other types of visual stimuli. So we say that this region doesn't exist in a preliterate child. So we can use this to our advantage, and actually that's why we decided to study reading first. So we can scan children before they know how to read, before they have this reading area, and we can make predictions about where this reading area might land in each child's brain, and then we can invite the same children back after they've learned how to read, after they have this reading area, and we can say, how good did we do? And it turns out we can actually do pretty well. So we're going to look at a inflated image of the brain. So on the top is, so we're looking at the underbelly of the brain, right? And on the top is a child's actual reading area. So, and, and on the bottom is what was predicted for this child's reading area using a brain scan that was acquired two years before a child learned how to read. So we can pick up on the location of this reading area quite well in each individual child. And the reason that we can do such a good job at predicting this reading area is because this brain tissue is already talking to the right set of regions. So it's already connected to regions like language areas, which presumably would help a visual region become selective to written words. So this reading area, so this brain tissue is already fertile ground to become a reading area because of its connections. And so this is cool because what it means is that we can use neuroimaging to predict what the brain will look like years from now, and that's super exciting. But we want to know if we can go even further. We want to know, can we predict things like individual variation in behavior using neuroimaging? So we and other labs around the world are trying to see if we can predict things like dyslexia using a pre-reading brain scan. And there's some preliminary evidence to suggest that the reading circuitry is already different in a child who may go on to develop dyslexia versus a child who will go on to be a typical reader. And again, these findings are preliminary, but what this means is that we could use neuroimaging to predict things like dyslexia and thus intervene early on and prevent years of struggling with learning how to read. I've talked about the static aspects of the brain so far. 
So what about the brain today will predict future outcome in each child. But we're also interested in the dynamic aspects of the brain. So what changes in the brain as a child learns, as they develop, and as they gain new skills. So we're working with other labs to try to build up a big enough database such that uh, we can see how changes in experience change brain and behavior. And finally, we're trying to go as early as possible, and we're scanning neonates. And this is me scanning my newborn, and we can scan neonates while they're asleep in the scanner. And actually, my baby slept better inside than she did outside the scanner, so go figure. So we scan neonates longitudinally starting from birth, and the idea is that we will build a big enough database such that we can predict things like like developmental milestones, like walking and talking, as well as cognitive abilities as a child gets older. So it's important to study the developing human mind for both basic science reasons as well as for practical reasons that will help improve society. On the basic science side, this allows us a way to make testable predictions, which is key for scientists, right? So if we can put everything we have into this question, if we can use cutting edge knowledge in cognitive neuroscience and pair that with cutting edge knowledge in computational science and make the best predictions possible, we can see how well we did. If we did a good job, it means that we understand the link between brain and behavior quite well, and that's awesome. But on the flip side, our inaccuracies at making these predictions will tell us what areas that we need to focus on to help deepen our understanding of the brain. So we can use this predictive framework to test important questions like the nature versus nurture question non-invasively in humans. We can see what about our brains makes us into the unique individuals that I see before me today. And we can also test things like the typical developmental trajectory and see how different changes in experience can shift that trajectory. On the education side, I could dream. Imagine being able to predict things like math ability and reading ability in each child. I think it would mean wonders for personalized education. On the clinical side of things, if we're able to offer predictions early on, even before a child can be diagnosed with a developmental disorder, or even before the relevant behavior exists, like in the case of predicting dyslexia using a pre-reading brain scan. If we can do this early on, it means that we can intervene earlier and earlier and help improve the quality of life of families and perhaps even prevent the onset of a disorder to begin with. So cognitive neuroscience is now at the point where we can and we should be studying the developing human mind longitudinally. And now is the time that we need to work together as scientists to work with each other and to standardize our protocols and to pool our resources and to dream big, right? And to, to help improve society such that we can help inspire the next generation of young scientists, policymakers, educators, clinicians, and hopefully someday, be able to offer practical advice for parents who are wondering what is my child thinking about and how can I help them achieve their highest potential. Thank you.